online. Um, and so I'm uh, Dr. Corey Matches, and I'm a geographer. Yes. Okay. I, I mean, I can hear it up here, but is this better? Okay. It's just it's like ringing in my ears. Okay. Um, <laughs> So um, I'm in the geography department, and so we teach a lot of classes about weather and climate. And a lot of my research looks at rainfall patterns from hurricanes. And so uh, my title slide, I have uh, radar images from several landfall and hurricanes here in Florida. And so in a couple slides in, I'll reveal which storms these actually are. But first, I just wanted to sort of advertise our Department of Geography and uh, let folks know that we do have a certificate program in meteorology and climatology. And so we do accept online students as well as residential. And we're also developing a major in meteorology. And so for the longest time, UF has not had a program in meteorology. And so we're really excited. We've hired some new faculty uh, and to be able to give that option to folks in Florida um, who wanna come to UF and study atmospheric science. Okay, so I've organized my presentation into uh, a couple of different parts to kind of segment it, and I've embedded some of those menti questions at the beginning and ends of the different sections. And so the first part, we'll do a little bit of a scientific overview, and we'll talk about uh, how tropical cyclones form and uh, what conditions they need in order to form and maintain their intensity. Um, and then part two, we'll focus on sort of the hazards of the storm and uh, what they can do and where the hazardous areas are in relation to the storm center. And part three, we'll um, talk about some local effects here in Florida. And then I'll have just one of the research projects that I've worked on just to kind of give you an idea of how geographers um, analyze tropical cyclones. Okay, so for part one, just kind of a question to get us all started. So uh, I wanted to do one that wasn't a vote, one yes, no thing. So what's the name of the first hurricane that comes to your mind? Now, granted, I planned this way before, obviously, this past week, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, a lot of hurricanes hit Florida. What are folks, uh, what's the first storm that comes to your mind here? It'll make a, a cool little word cloud for us. So we're getting a lot of Andrews, and rightly so, since that was uh, uh, a record landfall uh, back in the 90s, and uh, it actually changed a lot of the, the way that we do things here in Florida. Um, and so we probably expected Dorian, but uh, Katrina obviously made national headlines with its impacts as well, and Irma was not that long ago. Um, okay, so let's jump into the presentation then. So let's talk about which storms that I have. Uh, let's see, and there's our laser pointer. Okay, so anybody have a guess at this storm here hitting the Florida Panhandle? It's a recent storm. Michael, yeah. Unfortunately, Tallahassee radar went down, and so we actually aren't even seeing this part of the storm because the radar went down. Um, and then uh, here's another fairly recent one. Any guesses here? Irma, yeah, so Irma was huge. And so here's the center of Irma, so remember it laid landfall in the Florida Keys, and it is actually out of our radar range of, of Key West here. Um, and then, so I can go ahead and clip forward and reveal the, uh, the rest here. Um, and so you can see we've had a lot of, these are all hurricanes at landfall. And so we have um, lots of different spatial patterns the storms can take. Some of them have a bigger eye, some of them have a smaller eye, some of them are more elongated north and south, some of them are more round. Um, and so there's a lot of different configurations these storms can have, and that's one of the reasons why they're so hard to predict. So let's zoom out to a global view. Where do these things form and where do they move? And so what's really maybe kind of interesting here is where you don't see the tracks. So you don't see them right along the equator. And you also aren't seeing as many in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly on either side of South America. And so we'll talk in a moment about the conditions that these storms need to form and intensify, 
But one of the things they do need is to be able to be organized by the Earth's rotation. There's a force called Coriolis force. And that force is non-existent right at the equator. And so that's a reason why we don't see the storms form at the equator. And it's also a reason that they don't move across the equator into the other hemisphere. So it's getting a little technical here, but I just wanted to give you a background and I'm sure we have some really scientific minded folks out there. And so there's six sort of basic criteria that you need to develop a tropical cyclone. And we break them up into the thermodynamics. And so we can think thermo like thermometer. So that's your heat and moisture. And then dynamics, we can think about motion. And so for thermodynamics, we need warm ocean waters. That is the fuel source for a tropical cycle. They form from the bottom up. And so when you get enough water underneath that's got enough energy to be evaporated, we can uplift that energy into the storm and condense it out. So that's the process of late heat relief, and, and that's what fuels the storms. So in order to get those air parcels to rise up and release their energy, they need to be able to rise up on their own at some altitude. This is a tricky one for my students, and we spend a lot of time at lecture doing diagrams about what it means to be conditionally unstable. So we'll kind of tiptoe over that, other than to say we need bubbles of air to be able to rise up on their own and condense to make the clouds and to make the rainfall. We also need enough moisture in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, because if we don't have enough moisture, we're gonna have evaporation instead of condensation. And so if we have evaporation, what that means is, is the clouds dissipate. And so if it, we, the hurricane runs into dry air, the storm's gonna dissipate. Um, so that's something they're always on the lookout for is, is it gonna stay over warm water and is the atmosphere moist enough to support the storm? Then getting on to the dynamics. So we need this source of spin. So in the Northern hemisphere, low pressure systems spin counterclockwise. In the Southern hemisphere, they spin clockwise. But we need something to get that process going. And for a lot of Atlantic basin hurricanes, it's these thunderstorm clusters that come off of the African continent that move over the Atlantic Ocean. And then they're able to develop. Um, so we have, you might have heard of the term easterly waves. There might be 40 to 70 of these easterly waves that are forming at um, any one time during a season. But thank goodness we don't have 40 to 70 hurricanes that form during a hurricane season. So not every cluster develops into a hurricane. And that's because there are a lot of limiting factors. Um, so we already touched upon this one. You gotta be far enough away from the equator. And then the other thing that we need to have is we need to have fairly weak winds in the upper part of the atmosphere. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to build this bubble of warm, moist air. And so if we have strong air blowing over the top of it, we can think about, well, it's gonna burst the bubble. It's not gonna let that bubble form and continue to power up. And so if the hurricane runs into an area where the winds are really fast aloft, that's gonna break up the storm as well. So it can handle a little bit, but not a lot. So those are just some of the basic things. I get a lot of questions about climate change and hurricanes and the projections are, yep, we should have the energy available, but we don't know about the air parcels rising because it depends on the temperatures higher up. There's always going to be dry pockets. And so if we get a lot of dry, dusty air, that's not good for the storms. And then this is a big limiting factor, especially in that El Nino season. Uh, there's a lot of wind shear in the main development region of the Atlantic. And so that keeps development down under those situations. So this is a really hard to predict ahead of time. So let's just take a cutaway view of a, of a tropical cyclone here. So we've got an area of low pressure near the Earth's surface. And areas of low pressure mean that the air are going to converge in from the center. And then when air converges, it's got nowhere else to go but up. So the air is going to be forced to rise up. It's going to condense and release its latent heat and form these nice, tall, cumulonimbus clouds. And these can form our spiral bands. So the fastest winds are right around the center of the storm. And then you have a clear spot that forms in the middle called the eye. And that clear spot is there because air is actually sinking. So in the eye wall, air is rising, but right in the middle, air is sinking down. And so sinking air keeps the skies clear. 
So that's why people talk about you can see down to the ocean surface if you're flying through the storm, or if you're on land and you look outside during the eye, you could actually see the sky or the stars if it's at night. And so these rain bands can be organized in different patterns around the storm. And they can be, storms can be different sizes too. And so they tend to actually be biggest in the Pacific Ocean basin. Um, they're not quite as big usually here in the Atlantic, um, but there's also a lot more warmer water over the Pacific climatologically speaking. So let me walk through how you sort of diagnose these different conditions with an example from Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Um, and so this is the official uh, track map that the National Hurricane Center published after the, stor after the storm season is over. And so you can see the tracks of all the storms throughout the season. The purple area means it was a major hurricane, a category three or above. So those are the most um, damaging storms. And you can see there's a lot of purple on the map in 2017. So there was a lot of energy out there that hurricanes were creating. And so Harvey's track was a little bit disorganized at the beginning, but after it crossed the Yucatan, it started to develop really rapidly. And our forecasts of that were very good. We knew it was going to become a major hurricane. We knew there was going to be issues with wind and storm surge at landfall. And we had an idea it was going to slow down and make a lot of rain. So let's look at all those conditions together. So in terms of looking at sea surface temperatures globally, a lot of times you're going to have activity in this part of the world too at this time of year. But Harvey was the only thing in town on this day. So it was that tropical storm intensity had just come across the Yucatan Peninsula and it was about to intensify into a hurricane. And so here is the cloud cluster that's associated with Harvey. This is an infrared satellite image, so it's showing temperature. And so the wider areas are the colder cloud tops. Here we can see a zoomed in view of the sea surface temperatures. And so red is 30 degrees Celsius, and this maroon pole is 31 way warmer than our 26 degree threshold. So plenty of energy out there for the storm to take up. This is giving us a sense of how much energy is down with depth in the ocean. If the storm sits over one area, it's gonna churn up the water and cooler water will come up underneath if it's there. So we need a, a deep layer of warm water, not just a little shallow surface layer. And so we have, you can see these red colors mean more energy with depth. So Harvey was about to, go over this really warm area. Then if we look at moisture in the atmosphere, this is something called precipitable water. And what this tells you is in a column throughout the troposphere, if all the moisture rained out, how deep would it be? Now it's not technically possible to rain every single bit of moisture out, but um, we can see that Harvey was in an area of ample moisture. And so there was no limitation there. So we have our thermodynamics are all in play. Then if we look at the rotation, the vorticity, Harvey's got the strongest rotation of anything on the map. And then if we look at the winds in the upper troposphere, here's Harvey right here. I know it might be a little bit hard to make out with this map, but this is Florida. And there's the Texas coast and there's Harvey sitting there. It's in the green, the green's good. So there's a little bit of wind up there, but it's not so bad. So Harvey was in a really good spot. And you can actually see the sheer tendency is dropping. So the conditions were getting better as Harvey moved into the area. And like I said, this was actually forecast fairly well. So here's an example of the um, forecast cone that the National Hurricane Center issued. And there's a lot of misconceptions still, despite our best education efforts, um, about what the cone means. A lot of folks think it means it's the whole area of the hurricane, and because it gets bigger at the end, the storm's going to get that big as well. But how the cone is actually developed is it's based on the five-year average forecast error based on climatology. And so what it means is the area that's inside the cone the storm center should be within that area two thirds of the time. And so can the storm center be outside of that? Yes, actually about a third of the time. Can the outer rain bands be outside of that? Definitely. Can you get damage outside the cone? Yes. So this is not the damage cone. 
This is just where the center might go. And so as we talk about some of the impacts, we'll see how it's not just the fastest winds that can cause a big problem. And then the National Hurricane Center, so located down here in Miami, is responsible for the entire Atlantic Ocean Basin, issuing uh, watches and warnings for tropical storm force winds and hurricane force winds. And so you can see here the warning for the hurricane force winds issued. And then there's also a um, tropical storm warning then for a little bit further up the coast. And so uh, the National Hurricane Center's main responsibility is to issue wind watches and warnings at the coast. After the storm moves inland, it becomes the responsibility of your local National Weather Service office to issue statements about what might happen inland, to issue things like flash flood warnings, tornado warnings, um, inland wind warnings, extreme wind warnings. So there's got to be cooperation between the NHC and your local National Weather Service office so that everybody's uh, safety is kept in mind. And so the other thing to think about is the rainfall prediction. The National Hurricane Center does not actually predict the rainfall. That is the job of forecasters at the Weather Prediction Center, which is located in College Park, Maryland. And I was able to give a talk there this summer and hope to meet some of the forecasters, so it was, it was a pretty cool opportunity to go up there. And so you can see the forecast here for Harvey with that sort of bullseye of rain right over the Texas coast. Okay, so. How much of that did you pick up on? Which of the following does the National Hurricane Center issue? So your choices are hurricane warning, tornado warning, flash flood warning, inland wind warning, or all of these. So if you don't think it's all of them, then you know it's only one of them. Well, it looks like we've got a clear leader here. Anybody else want to chime in? All right, so yes, the correct answer is the National Hurricane Center is responsible for issuing hurricane warnings. That's their job. Tornadoes, flash floods, inland conditions, local National Weather Service office. All right, people are paying attention. And so just to follow up on that, the Weather Prediction Center updates its forecasts for rainfall. And you can see here that for Harvey, it was over two feet of rain at this time, and they increased it here to about two and a half feet of rain. Now, yes, they ended up getting even more than that, but the forecast actually verified fairly well because two feet of rain is gonna cause a problem. Whether it's two feet and one inch, two feet, two inches, three feet, you're going to have a problem in an urban area when two feet of rain falls. So the Weather Prediction Center was, was well on their game for this storm. Okay, so let's talk about what happens after the storm comes. Okay, so let's see how knowledgeable we are about the hurricane or the safe distance and hurricane scale. So, which of the following are currently considered? And yes, the safe and system scale has changed over time. But right now, what does it consider? Minimum central pressure, max sustained wind, storm surge height, maximum wind gust. Those are your options. So once again, we have a consensus. It is the maximum sustained wind speed. The old Safer Simpson scale did have a column for pressure. It did have a column for storm surge height, and it did have a column for gust. But what we learned over time is, number one, it's very hard to measure a gust. So those were mostly calculated engineering wise. Um, storm surge heights are not particularly correlated to the intensity of wind that you might receive. There's a lot of other factors which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so now they've taken away all the other categories and it is just based on the maximum sustained wind. So then one other question before we get rolling here into the hazards. Which hazard do you think is responsible for the most deaths on the per storm basis for the tropical systems in the US? 
So on a per storm basis, storm surge flooding, wind, rainfall induced flooding, and rip currents. And yes, people do unfortunately suffer from all of these, but on a per storm basis, which one do you think is the highest? All right, so we, we reached a bit of a consensus here that we got the majority are saying storm surge flooding. A couple of folks are saying rainfall induced flooding. And so the answer awaits us. So overall, the total number of deaths, water kills more than wind. And overall, storm surge takes the lead because when we do have a strong surge event, a lot of people can be impacted at once. However, on a per storm basis, it is actually the rainfall in induced flooding. So we can have rainfall induced flooding, even if it's only a tropical storm, only a tropical storm. So the maximum sustained winds aren't even hurricane force. But if the storm stalls out and dumps a lot of rain, we can get a lot of flooding from that. And then people might, you know, be out driving and get swept away. That's actually where a lot of folks um, run into problems when they're driving on flooded roadways, especially at night. Um, and they might get swept off a bridge into a ravine. So it is on a per storm event, it's much more frequent for rainfall to be uh, the major cause of loss of life. So let's compare what the safer sense and scale used to be made of to what it is now. And I have cropped this, and I don't expect you to read it at all. There's a lot of information, uh, but no, it does post on the National Hurricane Center's website. So it is out there for the public if you wanted to look it up yourself. So before they said category one was minimal, then moderate, extensive, extreme, catastrophic. Those are the, the one word descriptors they used. And notice they did have pressure, the velocity of the max sustained wind, and that's in meters per second. So sorry, it's not. Uh, uh, audience friendly here, like miles per hour, and they did have a gust as well as a surge and example storms. But they went through and they took out surge because of what happened largely with Hurricane Ike in 2008. So Ike was only in category two, but it had so much energy that it stirred the waters up well in advance of the storm, and there was a record storm surge that washed over Galveston and washed away a lot of holes. So some people didn't leave because they said, well, hey, it's only a cat two. Why do I need to leave? Surge shouldn't be that bad. So there's a lot of other things to consider other than just the one minute maximum sustained wind near the center of the storm um, when you're considering storm surge. And so we can see now that the working is not minimal anymore for cat one, but it's very dangerous, extremely dangerous, devastating, catastrophic, catastrophic. Now, the safer Simpson scale was developed by uh, an engineer who went out and actually did surveys of damage after hurricane. So it is based on the amount of structural damage as well as damage to trees and uh, vegetation. And so I just put one category here. They have columns and columns of categories, residential, commercial, trees. Um, but this was just the column that was the shortest one to put in, if you can believe it, but apartments, shopping centers, and industrial buildings. And then they've updated their examples. So Hurricane Dolly, 2008, Francis in 04, Ivan in 04, Charlie in 04. So, you know, there's three Florida's in 04, right? And then uh, Andrew from 92 as our Cat 5 example. So it'll be interesting to see since Michael was upgraded that made landfall of last year, maybe Michael makes its way into the an updated hurricane uh, safer system scale at some point. Okay, so that's sort of the wing side of things. So let's think about storm surge for a minute. So the actual surge comes about because a small portion of it is the pressure. So when you have lower pressure above the ocean surface, the ocean can rise up underneath of that. But the bigger amount of rise comes from the energy that the uh, tropical cyclone is putting into the ocean. And then as that energy, as the ocean waters are coming on shore, there's less and less depth for it to be expended over. So it starts rising up and up 
and onshore. And so it's a combination of the pressure and the winds. But what determines your individual storm surge height at your location? One of the um, uh, underlying factors is um, the actual coastal configuration as well. Um, so something that they always talk about, so they try to forecast the storm surge, but then they have to know locally, what are the astronomical tides doing? So is the surge gonna come during the time of high tide or at the time of low tide, then it won't be quite so bad. Um, so the overall storm tide is the surge and the astronomical tide. But that doesn't include wave setup or rainfall. I'm getting like an arm cramp, sorry. <laughs> um, so there can be more water than is actually forecast by just the surge forecast alone. And so this was an example. Um, so you can go to tidesandcurrents.noaa.gov uh, and you can actually look at these ocean gauges uh, in live format. And this was from Hermine, if you remember that impact in Cedar Key. Um, back in 2016. And so this is the predicted rise and fall of the tides. And then you can see how her mean came up and it was about 9.8 feet at its max. And it was made worse because we were on our way towards the high tides as well. And so it does depend on when that surge of water rises. If it comes at high tide, it's going to be worse. So you got to remember that the total water rise is multifaceted. So it is the surge, which the National Hurricane Center is trying to predict and warn folks about. But locally, then you have to think about what's happening with the tides. There's also the waves that are crashing on top of that. And then there's the rainfall that could be falling, washing into the rivers. The rivers are trying to move out as the surge is moving in. That piles up water in the bays and inlets as well. So it's a complicated picture. So it's up to folks to to know that they're elevation above sea level and to be able to know if they're in a danger zone and to follow evacuation orders if they're when they're issued. Okay, so tornadoes are another um, occurrence that tropical cyclones can cause. And we just saw that with Dorian. We saw some damage from tornadoes that it produced. And so this is a study by Schultz and Cecil that kind of shows the geography of where these tornadoes have occurred. These are all from landfall and tropical cyclones. So it's not just the coastal thing. They are actually occurring, each of these lines is 200 kilometers. And so you can see, yeah, the coastal band gets affected, but quite a bit inland can also get tornadoes. And the tornadoes can be forming before the, the storm actually makes landfall, and they can happen after the storm makes landfall. So the tornado threat is fairly persistent with some of these storms. And you can see here with some of these totals, Ivan in 2004 was a record with 117. Uh, we hadn't seen that number since uh, Beulah back in 1967. That was a, a Texas landfall there. And so where do the tornadoes tend to form in a tropical cyclone? And so if we're looking quadrant rise wise, so we name uh, hurricane quadrants, there's the front and the rear, there's the right and the left, and it's how the storm is moving. So if the storm, if you are the storm and you're walking forward, you got your left and you got your right. So the right front quadrant, that leading side of the storm where the winds are fastest, and that's where you get the most tornadoes as well. If you were rotating it so that north was at the top of the page, a lot of times the right front overlaps with the northeast because we're coming into the Gulf Coast from the south, moving south to north. And then this diagram is just kind of showing contour intervals, and you can see where the bullseye are. It's not at the center of the storm. It's actually out in the outer rain bands. So these uh, dashed lines, this is 400 kilometers away from the storm center. So anywhere between two to 300 kilometers out is sort of the bullseye where the tornadoes tend to fall. So just because you're not in the eye, you could still have potential damage from strong winds from a tornado that's falling. And then looking at rainfall, which is what I study. Just to give you a sense of what some of the record rainfall events have been. Now, the data that we've analyzed so far goes back to 1940. So there could have been earlier than that. But if we look at the Florida, it's the storm called the Easy in 1950. 1950 is actually the first time we started naming 
the storms. But they didn't get people names for a couple of years. So we can see here that this is kind of a weird storm track that kind of spun off the coast here. And that's where we got the record rainfall in Yankee Town of uh, about 45 inches there. And then the Georgia rainfall record was Alberto in 94. But interestingly enough, right, it was a Florida landfall. And then here in Florida, they got more rain on the left side of the track. But then the rainfall maps was cleared up here in Western Georgia. So rainfall can also be a threat, not just along the coast, but hundreds of kilometers inland and away from the landfall site as well. Okay, so just the place to kind of close out this part, true or false, storm surge is the total water rise that will occur. All right, yes, we have a consensus here that that's false because the total water rise also considers the tidal cycle, rainfall, and the wind-driven waves that would be on top of that. All right. So um, zooming in now to uh, more locally here in Florida. So just curious, who knows where our forecasts come from in Gainesville? Where is our National Weather Service office located? Is it Tampa, Tallahassee, Gainesville, or Jacksonville? All right, yes, the majority of rooms here as well. Jacksonville, Florida is the site of the National Weather Service office that makes forecasts for our conditions here in Gainesville. They also forecast up in Georgia as well. They have a, a fairly expansive warning area that they cover. So unfortunately, we do not have a National Weather Service office here in Gainesville. So let's think about the storm tracks that have come into our area. So I made this map by plotting. This is the county warning area of NWS office in Jacksonville. So this is all the area of responsibility. So us in Gainesville, we're in Alachua County here. And so I colored the tracks by month, but you can kind of see that all the colors are there. And so we're actually vulnerable to tropical cyclones all throughout the hurricane season. So the official season starts June 1st, and then ends November 30th. Hopefully, Florida residents are up on that, that trivia there. You can see we get a lot of tracks that actually come from southwest to northeast coming across. Um, but we can get tracks from a lot of different directions. So we are vulnerable um, from multiple different angles. And so when I look back through the history, our records go back to 1851 with Metro Basin. Um, and that's about 6% of all tracks that we have record of come through the Jacks County warning area. So um, it's not a small number, as you might think. Um, and so that's 133 actual tropical cyclones. So a little under one a year. And you can see, interestingly enough, there was a spike here in the early 1980s. And that was actually a quiet period for the rest of the Atlantic, but it was busy here in uh, our central border. This comes from a website called IB Tracks. And what I was able to do, you click close to the location that you're interested in, but it, you can't get right on it. So I clicked as close as I could to Gainesville. So it's the one degree box that does contain Alaska County. And it will plot all the tracks for you. So you don't need any fancy software. And then I pulled off the list by decade. Now, NN is not named because they didn't name the storms until 1950. And so you can see throughout the decades, the activity waxes and wanes. So here you can see the more recent season. 2000s were fairly busy as well, coming through our area. But actually, the decade that had the most activity was the 1880s. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tropical cyclones 
pass through. Of course, none of us were here at that time um, in order to um, experience any of those. But um, so you can see that a decade later, we just had one. So there is a lot of up and down turn in these statistics. And so just to think about three more recent tropical cyclones that have brought heavy rainfall um, to our area and how different the tracks can be. So there's not just one track that's gonna be bad for us. It can be bad for us when they come from lots of directions. So here is Francis in 2004, made landfall as a cat two down here and actually re-emerged over the ocean and made another landfall in the panhandle. But you can see here, we were in the 10 plus inch area, but interesting enough, the maximum rainfall was in North Carolina. So there is enhancement of rainfall when you have a mountain to push that tropical air skyward. Here we have Debbie from 2012. And so here the storm came more from the west and moved across to the east. You can see a left side maximum here for Debbie. It also took a, a kind of a slow track. It took a while to get organized. So a lot of rain fell over the northern part of Florida there. And then here's Irma. So surprise, surprise, we had surge, we had wind, we had tornadoes. And then here in North Central Florida, we also had flooding rainfall. And so for those of you that were here in these well, just two years ago, there was flooding around town as well. So in this case, the storm came more from the south. So here we have a track from the east, a track from the west, a track from the south. But here again, we are in that 10 plus inch area. So we could potentially have bad conditions from a multiple um, different types of storm tracks. Okay, so just to see if you're paying attention here. So a moment ago, we talked about the different decades, the activity that was near Alaska County. So which of those decades saw the most traffic? All right, folks are paying attention. That's good. <laughs> All right, yes, 1880s, there were seven of those storms that came through. Okay, so then I just wanna talk very briefly about some of the research that I've done so that you can get a sense of how a geographer might study hurricanes, which might be a little bit different perspective than a meteorologist or atmospheric scientist. So this is a leading question. Which of the counties, or no, sorry, of the counties in the U.S. that experience tropical cyclones most experience wind more frequently than they do rain? What do you think? So the statement is saying wind is more frequent than rain. And that's what I'm going to show in my study. We'll actually look at that on the map, which one is more frequent. All right, so we still have a clear majority. All right, so we've all been on the same page here most of the night. That's been great. So now we will see what the study reveals. So let's just think for a moment about delineating the edge of something. So when we have something like a high water mark, we know how high the water got. I had a chance to uh, drive along the coast with some of my students, and we stopped at this marker here that showed the uh, storm surge type for Camille in 1969, and then Katrina in 2005 at this particular location. You can see the oceans right out there. So we actually had a mark, a line drawn. Okay, we know where that was. Well, what are, well, how do you mark the edge of a cloud? You know, it's a little bit tricky because, you know, there's all these molecules out there, and then you kind of know when you're in one, when you're flying through it. But when you're on the edge, are you in, are you almost in? It becomes a little bit trickier, a little bit more subjective. And then even if you look at on the ground, okay, it's starting to rain. Well, is it raining right here? Or well, you would say it's raining here, but then what about what your instrument would say? If you had a rain gauge, one drop of rain doesn't set the rain gauge off. So the rain gauge would tell you, oh no, it's not raining yet. But you're standing there going, oh, it's raining, I'm getting wet. Again, there's some subjectivity here, and there's limits to our ability to measure at a really, really fine scale a lot of times. But the 
this is an important question to a geographer. We measure space. We're very interested in how things evolve in a spatial context. And so for years, geographers have calculated spatial properties. And a lot of that was with uh, urban geography, the shapes of states, the shapes of cities, the shapes of voting districts, which is, continues to be a very contentious thing. Um, and so we have different calculations to figure out where the center is, the travel time to get to a certain location. I saw this paper talking about the Bruce and Clark method. And what they're trying to do is say, in this shape, we have a center, and then we can measure the distance to the center in equally spaced intervals. And then there's a formula that we can tell something about that shape. Is it round? Is it asymmetrical? And so I said, well, why can't that be the center of a tropical center? And this is sort of like the outer edge of the storm. And so that's what actually got me into the hurricane research that I do now. And so here's just an application of that research. So I have here data that's showing rain rates for this tropical cyclone that's out over the Indian Ocean about to make landfall over Madagascar. And so I contoured or outlined the one millimeter an hour rain rate. And then I zoom that in here, and then I've got the storm center and I've got my equally spaced lines radiating out. And then I actually measure where these lines intersect the edge of the one millimeter an hour rainfall. And then I can average those over the quadrant and say that, you know, the northwest quadrant extends uh, further in this area than the southwest quadrant extends. And so that's just one of the many, many ways that we could measure space. But that was inspired by this urban geography study back in the 1960s. And so this has applications to tropical cyclones. The more intense the storm, your category four, your category five, like this of a Dorian, the more round it is, the more symmetrical it is. The weaker the storm, because it has that vertical wind shear that kind of pushes the storm over, it gets more asymmetrical. We can measure that. How fast does it become asymmetrical? If we have dry air that entrains or wraps around the storm and comes into the center, we can see how the clouds dissipate when that happens. And so the shape will change. So why shouldn't we measure those changing shapes and let them tell us about something that's happening to the storm? So let me present an example here that were, uh, my student Yao and myself measured rainfall that was um, collected on stations at the ground by rain gauges, gridded over across the entire US, and available since 1948 as a daily total. And so what we did is we said, okay, we'll have the storm, we'll figure out where the rainfall is that belongs to that storm, we'll merge all those daily rainfall totals together, and we'll get this swap, this area in gray. So this is the area that received rainfall from Hurricane Francis 2004. So here's one day's total, here are the outlines of the different days we analyzed, and then this is all together. And then what we did is we measured how far out did the rainfall extend from the storm center? How wide was it? How wide was this rainfall swamp? And did this wind change over time? Now, because this is rain gauge data, we don't have observations over the ocean, so that's why I had to stop on the edge. So we can only measure areas where it didn't go off into another country or into the ocean. But you can see here with Francis, it actually does get wider over time on that left side. And then we also used a study by Crocodile who looked at the extent of winds. Now they didn't tailor that extent to every storm. They used sort of an average extent based on the storm's intensity at the time. Whereas our analysis was tailored to every individual storm. So we ended up with, um, over 250 of these rainfall swamps we were able to measure. And so when you look at where they made landfall, we moved them. We had 104 Gulf Coast landfalls, 108 Florida landfalls, and 53 East Coast landfalls. And of course, they last a little bit longer when they make landfall along the Gulf Coast. A lot of times, these Florida landfalls cross back out over the ocean. 
And a lot of times these East Coast landfalls either go up into Canada or they recurve and go up into the ocean. So if you're in the Gulf Coast, it might rain over you for a little bit longer when you have a landfall. So how wide are the storms in these different areas? They're not as wide in the Gulf Coast because we tend to have drier air sitting over here. So that limits the amount of rain on the left side. But they tend to be a lot wider on the right side because we got a lot more moisture. Circulation is coming up like this. And so it's pulling in that moisture from over the ocean. And so it's able to be bigger on that side. Now for these cases, we couldn't measure the right side, right? It was out over the ocean. We could only measure the left side. So we can see here about 230 kilometers on the left side. And people are like, oh, the left side, that's not the fast wind. We don't got to worry about that. Well, there's a good chance you might be getting some rainfall from the storm, even if you're on the left side of the forecasted track. So you need to pay attention. So here's where we map wind versus rain. So we did this for all the counties. And so areas where you don't see any counties didn't have any events to measure. And so what we're seeing here is the return interval of rainfall, the return interval of the wind, and then the cumulative difference. And I know the units are hard to see, but the purple is the most frequent and the yellow is the least frequent. So if you compare the rainfall frequency to the wind frequency, you can see most of the Carolinas are in purple. And here, only the coast is in purple. And if you look even into Ohio, it's in this dark blue, and down here, the dark blue doesn't even touch Ohio. So rainfall is more frequent inland than the wind event is for those inland locations. So when you subtract the two maps, the yellow color are the only counties where wind was more frequent. Every other county, rainfall was more frequent. And so especially along the Appalachian Mountains and then the eastern part of the Gulf Coast and Florida. <coughs> and then we also did an analysis of how many times per year you might be expected to get a TC rainfall event. The areas in purple, five to six times has happened in a given year. And a lot of that was from 2004 to 2005. Those storms took very similar tracks. And so it is not uncommon here in the south and even up along the northeast coast to have multiple rainfall events from a tropical cyclone in a given year. And we really need to think about what that means um, in terms of localized flooding and um, how folks should prepare. Um, so you need to know not just if you're in danger of storm surge flooding, but what about flooding from fresh water, from rivers and streams? And so we can see that that could potentially be a, a really big issue inland as well. Okay, so just wrapping back up, if you can remember from the start, if you want to take a class about weather at UF, which department do you visit? Uh, no courses are offered at UF. I teach them. I teach a bunch of them. <laughs> ah, two people. Oh, this is two people. Geology. I often get quoted in the media as being in geology. I have nothing against the folks in geological sciences. They're great folks. But I'm in geography. Geography studies hurricanes at, at the University of Florida. All right. So now is the time for Q&A. So thank you for your attention. All right, so Sadie's going to come around with the microphone. I'll try to. So I, it's all muffled. Like I can't, I can't hear it all. <laughs> A 
little bit, but it just the sound is so spread to me that it's hard for like like I don't know if you can just I don't know. He wants to know about lightning. So he, he wants to know about lightning in the storm. So not all tropical cyclones produce lightning. Generally, the force of the air going upwards isn't strong enough, believe it or not. So in order to get lightning, it's sort of a complicated process because you need positive charges and negative charges, and you've got to get a lot of friction built up. So you need a lot of upwards directed momentum. And so we saw a lot of lightning in Dorian because it was rapidly intensifying. And so the air was shooting upwards at a very fast rate. And so you got a lot of that friction going. And so we saw a lot of lightning in Dorian. And so often too, lightning is a bit more frequent in those outer spiral rain bands than they are right in the center. It's not that it can't happen in the center. We saw that it does with Dorian. But a lot of times the, the circular velocity um, helps to loft the, the particles upwards on the outer spinal rain band. So the same mechanism that helps those tornadoes to form out there also helps lightning to generate out there as well. So um, we're going to try to explain the And I apologize too, it's just like all the fan light here is a little sensitive, so I just hear buzzing right now because of all the fans going, so I'm really, really sorry. Uh, have you found that the diameter of the eye influences or is correlated to the amount of damage that the hurricane produces? So the diameter of the eye, so she asked about is the diameter of the eye correlated to the damage of the storm? And so what you can think about that's important about the diameter of the eye. The smaller the eye is, the faster the winds can go in the rotational direction. So it's the conservation of angular momentum. And the best example of that is if you think about a figure skater doing a turn, they can turn much faster when they make themselves smaller. And then when they make themselves bigger, they slow down. And so the smaller you are in the rotational motion, the faster you can go around with the same amount of energy. So the storms with a smaller eye, the more compact eye, can have the potential to have faster maximum sustained winds. So the larger diameter eye, the air has to go farther to make it all the way around. Now what can happen in a well-developed hurricane, if you put something called an eyewall replacement cycle, so what happens here is you've got the nice little pitiful eye that's formed, but there's so much energy that another band of convection forms outside of that. And it grows to the point where it cuts off the energy that needs to get into the center. So hurricanes gather their energy from afar and it gets all focused into the center. So you, it, it works because it feeds that energy into the center. If you cut off that channel and you can't get the energy into the center, then the storm is going to weaken. And so if you get that outer larger diameter eye well formed, it chokes off the air to the inner eye, so the inner eye dissipates. And now the storm has weakened because the fastest winds are at a larger diameter, a larger radius away from the center. Now that eye can contract and the cycle can start again. But that's often what is happening when, it, when you have a really strong hurricane in cat four, cat five. And so that makes slight differences to intensity when those cycles are ongoing. Hi. Um, if, in a more social context, um, in your experience, do you feel like there is more value placed on damage to infrastructure or damage to natural ecosystems? in like the aftermath of a hurricane? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think we hear a lot about damage to infrastructure because we have a way to quantify it, um, especially through things like insurance losses. That's where a lot of the um, damage statistics come from. And so, you know, folks that don't have insurance, if they make an insurance claim, they might've had damage, but it doesn't even count in the official report. 
Um, and that's especially true of um, flooding, because if you don't have a separate flood insurance policy, you're not getting covered from that flood damage. And so, um, so that's where a lot of the numbers come from in terms of damage. And so in, in general, we, we just don't have a good accounting system for ecosystem damage. Um, I can talk a lot about that, but I will choose not to talk a lot about that. But I will just say that that's you know, a factor is that you know, we don't agree on a value to, to put on it. Good question though. Very good question. So she wanted to know about the data from the 1880s. And so if you just talk a little bit about the history of scientific measurements and observations and communication, uh, which is actually the next chapter my students are doing in my hurricanes class. Um, so we didn't actually start flying into hurricanes until the 1940s. Um, we didn't have satellites until the 1960s. And so a lot of our earlier observations are from ship reports. And so um, the ship will carry a barometer. And so we actually would use the barometer readings of the ship would report and infer where the lowest pressure is, because hopefully the ship's not going right through it. And then use that to develop a past history. So unfortunately, there's a bias in the records for the shipping lanes and where there are islands where they actually had, you know, like Bermuda would have instruments on it. Um, now, once it makes landfall over a large landmass like the US, there's a lot of people living on the coast. So we had fairly good records there. But one of the tricky things to realize is we don't even now have good wind readings. Um, a category five hurricane is probably gonna break all of our anemometers. Um, and so it's really hard to get an actual reading. And so even today, what we do is we use satellite image and we infer the maximum speed wind from the pattern of clouds that we see on the satellite image. So oftentimes we don't have a direct measurement. We can, when we fly through, we can drop instruments down, but it can be very hard to hit the max wind because the thing's blowing all over the place as it goes down. Uh, we, but we can still get a better sense if we fly right through the center of the pressure drop. But the plane is not at the bottom, right? It's flying through an altitude. So we have to do some math to interpolate the actual reading. So, so even today, it's not precise. That's an excellent question. Yeah. So you talked about how um, you know different decades may have like, more hurricanes than the others. I was wondering like what trends you noticed for the decades that have like more hurricanes than others. Okay. So um, in the 1970s and 1980s, that was a time when there were fewer hurricanes overall in the Atlantic Basin. And so one of the things that was happening is we were also having droughts in the Sahel in Africa. And so those thunderstorm clusters that we need to, that are the seedlings of the hurricanes, the sources of spin, we need those to form and come off. But if it's dry over Africa, we're not getting as many of those cloud clusters in those times. And so that we don't have the seedlings to get the hurricanes to form. Now there is shorter cycles um, with the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So if we have an El Nino here, the upper level winds are really strong over the Atlantic. So that tends to mean there's less activity. So uh, 1997 was a, a really strong, you know, sort of record-breaking El Nino event. That season had very little activity in the Atlantic basin. I think there were only maybe six named storms, and the average is like 11. So it really can reduce the amount of activity uh, so, uh, over a shorter time cycle. I just have a real quick question. Um, so I feel like a lot of times the media coverage of hurricane information is hard to kind of take in and figure out what's accurate, what's not accurate, what I need to care about, what I don't need to care about. Do you have any recommendations for the best place to get information on hurricanes? Okay, so she was asking about um, recommendations on where to get the best hurricane for uh, information on hurricanes. Um, 
So we, we've actually, one of the studies that I did was uh, interviewing Florida tourists and trying to get their um, take on where they're getting their information from because they're not even from Florida. Um, and what would they evacuate and where do they get their information? And a lot of those folks said things like the Weather Channel, the internet. Um, so I think um, in previous times, more influence was placed locally. So your local weather person on the TV news was your trusted, you know, that's somebody that you recognize and they're giving you information. But they're getting their information from the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Office. But they're distilling it in a more consumer friendly and localized way. Um, and so the, since technology has changed, uh, there's so many more routes for information. A lot of people just have like personal blogs and they're sort of weather fanatics, but they may not have, you know, official training. And it can be hard. Um, and that's actually, I'm not a trained social scientist, uh, but there are social scientists out there who study this. And they try to identify where people get their information. And, but it's not just receiving it, it's also how you process it. And then whether you react, how you react, do you confirm the information with somebody else before you act? What are all those processes that you go through from, okay, message is sent. Do you even receive all the message? So there's a lot of stuff that that sort of the social scientists, you know, kind of psychology process as well. So I'm not an expert on that, um, but I'm sure there's some studies out there. Um, Rise up in climate change. Is that when I think of the source of the hemisphere that you are preparing? Um that, that would certainly um likely reduce the activity um because we need um, enough moisture over there and also how the the upper level winds flow in that part of the, the world to actually organize all that and bring it over to the ocean. And so um one of the also factors that can limit formation, not just that, but also the Saharan air layer. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but that's the dusty air that gets actually swept up into the lower and mid troposphere from the Sahara. And so you can actually see on satellite imagery these dust swirls that come off. And so having really dry, dusty air is bad. So even if back of continent somewhere, there's some moisture and some storm form, they hit that dusty pocket then it can't grow because it's going to evaporate when it hits all that dry air. Um, so that can definitely be a limiting factor. People ask me all the time, well, since temperatures are going to rise, are we just going to have more and more and more of these things? But you do have to think there are limiting factors, like the fast winds, the wind shear, or light dry air, or sources of spin. If those sources of spin aren't there, then the storm itself is not going to spin up. Now, in the Pacific Basin, the inner, well, okay, it's gonna get too technical. The intertropical convergence zone actually has little areas that spin off, and that is the most common way that a typhoon forms. So that mechanism would be a little bit less effective because it's way over in the Pacific. And so it would depend on the latitude of the intertropical convergence zone where that sets up. If that shifts, then maybe even their activity might shift around in response to that. Um, now we can still get formation by some other mechanisms. And one of our most common secondary formation is an old frontal boundary. So as a, a cold front or a fluted front um, comes off of, let's say the, the coast of the Carolinas, it'll have a little bit of counterclockwise spin in the tail end of it. Not a lot, it's still a little bit, but it's mixed around now and it's not so strong. It's not like a cold air mass behind it anymore. If it gets over the, let's say the Gulf Stream, that little bit of rotation can start the process of tropical cyclogenesis and a storm can actually form from an old frontal boundary. And that happens um, especially early in our season and late in our season. Um, so that can happen like off the coast of Florida, off the coast of North Carolina. Um, that can even happen in the Caribbean in November. So there are some other mechanisms, but the uh, majority. 80% of our major hurricanes are Cape Verde hurricanes. So they're forming from those thunderstorm clusters that come off of Africa. Um, we can let a few more questions continue in a minute, but I know some people are starting to leave, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming and being here tonight. And I wanted to give 
Um, Dr. Mackey says, thank you for being just for a round of applause. survey process, and I'm not a, um, like a, a water hydrologist, um, I, I, I don't feel comfortable commenting on sort of the accuracy of that. But what that means is, um, if you are in the 100-year floodplain, um, statistically speaking, once every 100 years, you could get a flood. So that is the threshold that's been adopted, that you know, if you're outside of that, then you might still get a flood, but it should be less often than every 100 years. But the key is, if you get that 100 year flood this year, are you exempt for the next 100? No. You could get one the next year. You could get one the same season because things are changing. So these statistics are projected on past data, but it doesn't preclude a future event from happening. It's just a probability. So it's also good to just know local conditions. I know they've updated them recently, which is a good thing, because the more development that happens, the more impervious surfaces that are put around town, the more they have to bury the, uh, the, the water conduits underground. They size those a certain way, but if more water comes through than those can handle, they could tear up the road above them and cause all kind of damage. Um, and so, you know, communities that maybe haven't updated need to update because there's so much development that's still going on. Um, and so that just makes the runoff worse, the more impervious surfaces, the more concrete and asphalt that you have, the worse it makes it. All right, my friend is ready to ask this one, but it's a fun one. What's your favorite hurricane? <laughs> hurricane, hurricane name? Me. Me, most of those in um, I'm kind of like a weirdo and I don't get into those a lot. So, I mean, my, my favorite meme that I've seen, I had, a, there was a hurricane scientist who put one at her talk at a conference and it didn't have anything to do with hurricanes, but she was explaining a concept and then she put up, there's like a sink outside a door and she put, let that sink in. So that I remember. So that's my like one example of a meme because I'm just not like the most social. I'm kind of awkward and strange. But it's a fun question. Thank you guys. <laughs> 